I appreciate this opportunity to discuss nociception during anesthesia. Nociception is not something that's unfamiliar to us at, at all. It's simply what would be called pain in a conscious patient or a conscious individual. Nociception is the physiological response to a noxious stimulus. During anesthesia, you don't have pain by definition, but you still have physiological responses. You have autonomic and other responses to this. Typically, anesthesiologists are conscious of noxious stimulation. We all know that patients having large amounts of stimulation require more anesthesia. They require analgesics also. The difficulty is that we don't have a good way of measuring it, and so most people simply look at the blood pressure. The trouble is that the blood pressure is a really poor measure of nociception. Blood pressure is influenced by many other things, and it's not a good indicator of nociception. Blood pressure is critically important, and some of you may know blood pressure is one of my favorite topics because I, I think it's critically important for myocardial outcomes after surgery, but it's not a good indicator of nociception. That, that's not what it's designed for, as it were. And so we end up using these sort of subjective, unvalidated measures. So it might be blood pressure, it might be heart rate, uh, maybe you see a patient who starts to sweat. If things get really out of control, your patient might start moving. But none of those is a particularly good measure of nociception input. And the result is that you end up with varying amounts of analgesia, which may or may not be appropriate for the amount of nociception your patient is experiencing. If you give excess of analgesia, then your, your anesthetic is too deep, but more importantly, patients don't wake up afterwards. They, they stay asleep too long, uh, they have too much analgesia on board, they're much more likely to have nausea and vomiting. Conversely, if we get it wrong and we give inadequate amounts of analgesia, then patients wake up screaming. They, they have high pain in the recovery room, and once people wake up with a lot of pain, it's very hard to recover. Then the temptation is to give too much analgesic, and you tend to overdo it, and then patients end up too deep for too long. So there's a lot to be said for getting it right, that is having patients wake up with an appropriate amount of analgesia. And the appropriate amount is not too little and it's not too much, and, and that's where it gets difficult. If, if you say the appropriate amount of analgesia is just not to give any, well, that's easy. Or you can snow everybody and give people too much. The difficulty is getting the right amount in individual patients. The right amount varies enormously from patient to patient, and that's the challenge. It varies because the nociception input differs as a function of operations, but also how patients sense the input and people's sensitivity to our primary analgesic opioids varies over a factor of 10 range. So it's very difficult in an individual patient to know whether you're giving the right dose. And mostly we don't. We tend to give some standard amount of an opioid, typically fentanyl, and hope that it works. Well, on average it works, but for individuals it doesn't work very well. Some have too much and some have an inadequate dose. Noiseception differs from most other aspects of anesthesia. So anesthesia, of course, is complex. It's not a switch. It, it's not a unitary function. Anesthesia has components which include autonomic control, prevention of movement, uh, prevention of consciousness and recall, muscle relaxation. So these are all components that we're dealing with. 
all of those have monitors. So we monitor twitch function. We monitor blood pressure and heart rate. We can monitor hypnosis with processed EEG. Uh, so all the major components of anesthesia are typically currently monitored with the exception of narcissception. We don't have a good monitor for narcissception. And that's what this is about. Uh, so we have this new NOL technology, which uses a variety of different measures to estimate a global nociception index for individual patients. It is based on various families of input, which include pulse rate, as heart rate, plethysmography, peripheral temperature, galvanic skin resistance, and movement, as well as heart rate variability. So there are all these potential measures of narcissception, and each of them have some basis. Each of these works at least under controlled circumstances, so there is rationale in choosing those particular measures. What NOL does is it combines these. So it takes all of these measures, puts them together, and comes up with an index between zero and 100 at the end. So it takes these measures and it combines them by magic and gets an answer. Actually, it combines them by using very sophisticated statistics, but it looks a lot like magic and it works well. So here's a typical sort of response for the NOL monitor. Now, granted, this is completely an anecdote, but I'm gonna show it to you because it characterizes the typical response with this monitor. On the left here, if you have no analgesia and no stimulation, you get a reasonably low, so this is 20 of 100 value, and it stays stable as you would expect. If you give patients a good dose of analgesia, say a substantial dose of remifentanil, and then you do something painful to them, nothing happens. That's what you would expect, actually, because you've provided enough analgesia to cover the noxious stimulus. So that, that's the expected response, but so far this hasn't been very revealing because nothing is happening. Here's where it gets interesting. So here is a very noxious stimulation, intubation. It's probably the single most stimulating thing that we do to patients, and the NOL shoots up. So you get a very clear response to this noxious stimulation. So this is an example with intubation, a very powerful noxious stimulus. But it turns out that you get graded responses with different levels of stimulation. So you go from a, an electrical stimulation to laryngoscopy to skin incision to intubation you get progressively higher responses in the NOL. In other words, it behaves exactly the way you would expect. And then this example is simply what happens when you have no pain and lots of analgesia. Then you get a super low level. So this is uh, similar to this one, except with analgesia and you've reduced the value from 20 to 10. Okay. I'd like to present now this set of results, and I take little responsibility for it because Ruthie Edry, who's in the corner there, actually did the study, and this is an entirely her work. This is a complicated slide, has a lot of information, so I'm, I'm gonna go through it in some detail. Each row here represents a different 
type of measure of noxious stimulation. So this is NOL, that's what we're primarily interested in, and these are the components of NOL or other measures of noxious stimulation, including heart rate, photoplethysmography, the pleth index, and entropy. So those, those are going across here. And then each of these columns is a different stimulus under a different condition. So these are uh, electrical stimulations. Basically, you hook up a nerve stimulator and do a tetanic stimulation. That's a fairly intense stimulation. It's almost as intense as a skin incision. So this is without analgesia, this is with analgesia, this is intubation, incision, and then without any stimulation at all. NOL consistently does what you would expect. So in response to electrical stimulation without analgesia on board, it increases. In response to the same stimulation, now with remifentanil on board, nothing happens. Just what you would expect because the remifentanil provides adequate analgesia. Intubation, I already showed you, is a very powerful response. And so, in fact, you get a big increase in the NOL level. Incision is a less powerful noxious stimulation than intubation, but it's still substantial, so you get an increase, but not as much as you do with intubation. And as you would expect, with nothing happening, the value is low and it stays low. Now, without going through all the details, I wanna point out that the other measures do not consistently do the right thing. So for heart rate, you expect an increase with a noxious stimulation. And we see here that on average, essentially nothing happens. So heart rate, something that is one of our go-to measures for evaluation of stimulation, actually worthless. It doesn't work. Photoplethysmography, you expect it to decrease with stimulation. In fact, it increases here. The pleth index, you expect to increase. In fact, it goes down. And if you go through the others, you see the same thing. So each of these measures sometimes works, but they often don't work. The only one that works consistently is NOL, probably because it incorporates five different measures in a nonlinear way to give you the right answer under various circumstances. The consequence is that when you do a receiver operating characteristics curve, so this is sensitivity versus one minus specificity, it's a measure of how good the combination of sensitivity and specificity are for a monitor evaluating dichotomous outcome. The closer you are to this line, these two lines, the better the measure. A random measure gives you a horizontal diagonal here. What we see is that NOL was really remarkably good. Very few monitors are that good. And that all the other monitors, so heart rate, photoplethysmography, pleth index, were considerably worse. From this, we conclude that NOL is better than any single existing monitor. And that's it.